Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are going to make a petroleum boiler. And I'm very excited because it's been multiple playthroughs since I've had enough water and oil to be able to make a petroleum boiler. And petroleum boilers are amazing. Essentially, what a petroleum boiler does is the same thing as your oil refinery. It takes crude oil and turns it into petroleum. That's it. But there's some differences. The oil refinery takes 10 kilos of crude oil and turns it into only five kilos of petroleum. So we're losing roughly 50% of the crude oil and it turns it into natural gas and stuff like that. Great for power stuff, but not exactly what we're looking for. The reason why we love the petroleum boiler is because of the petroleum generator. Because then when we throw petroleum through it, we get carbon dioxide and polluted water. How much water are you saying? Well, hold on to your hats. We know that we have three oil wells. Each oil well produces 3,333.33 grams per second of crude oil times three oil wells. That gives us a beautiful total of just say 10,000 grams. But remember, our oil well requires 1,000 grams per second of clean water times three oil wells that's 3,000 grams. If we had a way to turn 100% of that crude oil into petroleum, we'd then have 10,000 grams of petroleum. Each petroleum generator is capable of using 2,000 grams per second of crude oil. But remember, we have three oil wells giving us 10,000 grams of crude oil. So in other words, our math is gonna be based on the fact that we're gonna have five petroleum generators worth of oil. But here's the key. Remember those three oil wells are using 3,000 grams per second of clean water. Well, our petroleum generators are giving us 750 grams of polluted water times the five petroleum generators that we already proved that we can use because of the amount of crude oil we have. It actually gives us 3,750 grams of petroleum water back. So we're actually gaining an entire 750 grams per second of polluted water. Well, the petroleum generator does something else too. It produces 500 grams per second of carbon dioxide. We're running five petroleum generators. That's gonna give us 2,500 grams of carbon dioxide. If only we had some slicksters. Well, as luck would have it, I was digging this area out recently and guess what came out of one of the buried objects? That's right, we're now running slicksters. We got one slickster. He was age 33 or something like that, and it was terrifying. Okay, terrifying maybe be too strong of a word, but remember, it's minus 15 degrees down here. It was still living, though, because it was buried. So the game wasn't actually calculating it. It was kind of in like a cryo freeze, because your slickers can only live in 35 to 160 degree temperatures. Needless to say, we rushed over there with a trap. We trapped the slickers. We ran it up here to our beautiful power brick, which maintains about 60 degrees. So it's perfect. So how many slicksters are we running? Well, right now we have one ranch. Speaking of which, I need to update this to make sure it only says eight. And then we'll have some excess down here. Well, once we're running petroleum, there'll never be a need for us to run coal or natural gas generators. So I'm thinking we'll just go on hydrogen, petroleum, and then run a ton of slicksters. At a minimum, we're going to be producing 2,500 grams per second of carbon dioxide. Well, 2,500 grams per second ends up being about 1.5 million grams per cycle, or 1,500 kilos, to make it a little simpler. And our beautiful slicksters only consume 20 kilos per cycle, which means you can run 75 slicksters. That's more than the 48 hatches we're actually running. On a normal game, that's enough slicksters to feed 40 to 45 dupes. In our max difficulty game, it'll give us enough slicksters to feed about 20 duplicates. And that's not even counting all the meat that we're getting from our stone hatches. Needs to say, our calorie count is about to skyrocket. And all of this is possible because the way Clay designed the petroleum mechanics and the petroleum generator mechanics were based on the oil refinery, cutting the crude oil into petroleum, reducing the amount of petroleum you could actually get back out of it. And then you're further reduced by the amount of water that you have the ability to actually give the oil wells to produce that crude oil. Well, a petroleum boiler blows all that math up because it gives us 100% conversion. So how does a petroleum boiler work? In its simplest form, the only thing I want you to remember is liquid crude oil turns into petroleum 
at 399.9 degrees. That's all you have to do. Heat crude oil enough, it turns into petroleum. The key is you don't want to heat it past that because petroleum will turn into sour gas at 538.9. So you have about 138 degrees worth of playroom before you hit the sour gas level, which some people try to do that too. The next step past the petroleum boiler is a sour gas boiler because they'll superheat then the petroleum, turn it into sour gas, and then they'll cool it to turn it into methane. And then the methane, when it's heated back up, turns into natural gas, which is a whole nother way to produce power because it gives you so much natural gas, you'd never be able to use it all. The most popular petroleum boilers, I would say, use the magma dropper from a volcano. They use the heat from the magma, they put a door between it, that way they can control the temperature, and boom, you have your 400 degrees, and then you can start throwing crude oil in there, it turns into petroleum, and you're good. That's definitely a good way to do it. I highly recommend a video by Francis John, where he goes over petroleum boilers, and it's a great system. In our case, though, we're going to knock out two birds with one stone. We are going to heat our petroleum boiler using our magma layer. We have a ton of magma down here that we want to get rid of. But I know what you're saying. Well, once you use that magma layer, your petroleum boiler is going to stop. Well, if your petroleum boiler is efficient, it would take you over 5,000 cycles to siphon all the heat out of here. And by that time, let's be honest, we probably won't be playing this colony anymore. We want to turn a lot of this into igneous rock, because then we can go grab the igneous rock, cool it, and then feed it back again to our stone hatches. Even when we turn all this into igneous rock, we still have five volcanoes worth of magma, just in the magma biome alone. So yeah, we're going to be able to figure out a cool system where basically we're going to have an infinite source of magma, and we would be able to use that for an infinite amount of cycles on this type of petroleum boiler. Now, full disclosure, what I'm trying to do, I have never seen done. Now, I've seen geothermal petroleum boilers, but never quite the way I'm going to try to do it. So, good luck, have fun, we'll see. Step one, we need to clean this whole area out. We need to get rid of all the liquids and all the gases. And I'm probably underestimating this, but I think this should be good. We, of course, are going to start with a liquid lock. Now, we only need a single liquid lock here because all of this is going to be a vacuum. Well, if we do it right, it'll stay a vacuum. If we do it wrong, well, it's going to be a horrible end to our colony. But because it's going to be a vacuum, there'll be nothing to exchange heat with this crude oil or whatever liquid you use. We could use water in here, and it wouldn't really matter. Actually, it's 44 degrees down here. It would matter, because the water would freeze. Lucky for us, we have a ton of petroleum down here. We were using it as sort of a dumping ground when we just had some spare petroleum laying around. And we'll grab some of that and make our liquid lock out of it. While we're working on that, I wanted to give an update on our iron and gold volcanoes. And they are working amazingly. Our gold volcano steam room sits around 126, 125 degrees between eruptions. We already have 24 tons of gold sitting here. I moved our bottle emptier down one tile. It's because I always like to put a little roof over our liquid locks. And that way, if anything drips down here or falls from up here, it won't actually come into our liquid lock. Another update on the colony that you may have already seen if you watched the tutorial video I posted this week. We've tamed this hydrogen vent. The hydrogen in this bad boy comes out at 500 degrees. But because we have aluminum metal tiles and a bunch of diamond temperature shift plates, and we flow the hydrogen all the way through here, it never even has an opportunity to get to 125 degrees. It'll only get as hot as the steam does. We have a lot of steam in here. And when the steam finally does reach over 125 degrees, this steam turbine will have no problem taking care of it. And all that beautiful hydrogen comes all the way to the top of our base where the power brick is and supplies hydrogen generators. These hydrogen generators are the first line of power that we use. It's a clean energy source and it doesn't have any other effects save heat. We are nearly completed with picking up the mess inside here. We still got a little ways to go, but we're gonna go ahead and start vacuuming it all out. Since we needed power for the gas pumps, I figured it was time to put power in for the petroleum boiler. We actually ended up extending the power spine all the way to this side due to this gold volcano. We wanted the steam turbine to be able to put power back on to the network. So we had a heavy wire strand available. So we just ran it the rest of the way 
plugged in the large power transformer. We're all finished with vacuuming this place out, but we still have some stuff to pick up. It's been taking a long time to get everything picked up. Part of the reason why, because we had all those storage containers on top of our colony, and they'd have to haul it a long distance. So I figured now is probably about the time to do our little infinite storage using the automatic dispensers. They're sweep only and everything that we want to put in there. Oh, we don't want bleachstone in there or oxalite, but everything we really want swept gets dropped off into these. They drop it off right here because there's going to be so much debris here. It's going to provide a huge negative decor rating, and we don't want the negative decor on the side of the base where we're doing all of transportation. So eventually when we get a creative person, we're going to put a bunch of statues and stuff here to make it look real nice. Now, I'd like to start digging into the magma biome, but I'm not going to take any chance. We're trying to mop up this liquid carbon dioxide. If for some reason it actually turns into gas, carbon dioxide fills this chamber while we have magma open. Yeah, it would be bad news bears. All right, we've completed the vacuum and the deconstructing of all the gas pumps. We have a little bit more debris to be picked up, but we're just about there. Now it's time to start worrying about our heat source. And like we said before, we're going to be using the geothermal power, which means we need a heat spike. And I think the heat spike can go here, and that'll give us enough room for counter heat exchange here. Now to get down into here, we're going to be using the door method. The reason why I like this area right here is because we'll eventually, if need be, be able to go all the way down without running into this neutranium bit. I think for starters though, I think this would be a good enough heat spike. And when I say the door method, we're going to use mechanized airlocks and dig our ways down. We're going to be doing this because there's a little trick that allows you to actually build through an airlock even when it's closed. And when it's closed, no magma is going to be rushing forward. Well, as long as we've done it right. Now, if a little bit of magma does get in the way, well, we can open and close the door and kind of sandwich it out. But for now, this will do. And while the dupes are working on that, I wanted to show you a small expansion on our polluted water tank. We were having a problem that eventually the water would get too high and then our hydro sensor would shut this vent. Well, when it shut this vent, it would stop all of these from pumping because all the pipes were full. So all we did was expand the tank, but instead of just opening the tank up, we're going to use a small dam system. In other words, this area will continuously fill until it gets to about here and then it'll start dumping the excess over here. In addition to this tank where we have this cool slush geyser, and all these liquid pumps taking the polluted water from petroleum generators and the natural gas generators, we now actually have another polluted water tank thanks to this polluted water vent. Now, it would have been great to find this polluted water vent before we did our oxygen setup because the polluted water in this one comes out at 30 degrees, which is very nice. We're not going to do anything special. We're just going to let it continuously fill up until it fills up enough to the point where it overpressurizes this water vent. Right now, we don't have a use for this water, but you know, things. So right now, Star-Lord's coming down here to build this mechanized airlock. This isn't a big deal. Because there's no magma in this area, we don't care that he's actually stepping through each one. When we get it right about here, though, we're actually going to lock the mechanized airlock before we put the next one down to build. All right, we've just completed this construction. So now we've set this door to lock. Someone's going to come down here, lock this door, and as soon as they do, then we'll be able to put down the next door. But even though this mechanized airlock isn't actually touching any magma, it's touching the subsidian. And you can already see the temperature exchange that's happening. This door is at 1323 degrees and rising, and it spreads all the way up here, the very first airlock, surrounded by abyssal light and insulated tile, is still over 1300 degrees. It's this power that we're going to be able to drive this petroleum boiler. Since we're getting ready to break in the magma itself, we need to make sure that we build window tiles before we build these doors, and that way it prevents the magma from rushing in. Now, these ladders are made out of obsidian, and their melting point is 2726, so even magma won't melt them. And that's of critical importance for us to be able to later get down in there. So I started the door trick a little too early. You have to dig these out when this is unlocked because in order to dig it out, the door cannot be locked. We'll be able to do it down here when there is nothing to dig out. But right here, we actually still have to be able to get to those tiles. Here we go. See this door is locked. Star-Lord is still able to build it. It's working perfectly. Once this is completed, we'll build these window tiles then lock this door and continue on. All right, beautiful. Now this one is unlocked and this one is locked. 
so we can throw down our diamond window tiles. You might be saying, I remember you telling me a couple episodes that diamond window tiles were great with a huge thermal conductivity, but aluminum metal tiles were actually better. And they are for thermal conductivity. But notice here the melting point of aluminum metal tiles is only 660 degrees. Unfortunately, that doesn't exactly fit our use case. And now we have Star-Lord once again building some more window tiles. And once those are complete, we can then work on this door. So it is definitely a slow process, but it's one way you can actually burrow through magma without any sort of problems. Now let me fast forward this until I get the rest of it done. Oh, all these materials? Yeah, they're lost forever. Just forget about them. All right, we've finished it up. I think this is a good enough heat spike for what we're using. Now we're just going to deconstruct the rest of these airlocks. We're going to leave this airlock in case we ever want to expand. And it's not too bad of a thermal conductor as well. Now you've probably seen in pictures or other videos, people using just diamond window tiles as the spike. I don't necessarily like doing that because anytime that you want to expand your spike, you have to dig them all up and start over. This little corridor filled with diamond temperature shift plate actually helps even out the temperature shift and supplies more actual temperature heading towards this mechanized airlock. This is going to be the beginning of our heat plate that will eventually be responsible for boiling petroleum. Now that our spike is complete and our corridor is finished, we can actually build the rest of our boiler plate. But I want to take a minute to highlight. Look at the window tile down here at 1494 degrees. And all the way up here, the diamond window tile is 1486. That's only a drop of about 6 degrees. Well within our margins. So like I was saying before, we can cap it off with these two steel metal tiles. Now these tiles are actually our boilerplate and it's how we'll control the temperature flow to our petroleum. To highlight how this boilerplate is gonna work, you can see the steel tiles are completed and this mechanized airlock is still open. Well, if we give it a condition and say, hey, close that door. And remember these tiles started at 45 degrees. That door shuts. And instantly, those metal tiles get really hot really quick. We're actually going to deconstruct these tiles and create new ones because we want to start it off very, very slowly. Before we seal it back up again with the steel metal tiles, I wanted to make sure we put some power onto the mechanized airlock. An unpowered mechanized airlock opens and closes slower. We want it to open and close lickety split. That way we can more precisely control the temperature of our petroleum. All right, we're finished with primary construction. And a petroleum boiler is one of those things that you really wish you could explain it backwards. Because of the way it functions, it really is just easier to explain it that way. I'll explain it first, then we'll try to get it going, and then I'll be able to give you the holistic picture. But basically, we're going to be bringing in our cold, crude oil from this direction. It's going to come down here and filter all the way up here. And if you've never seen one of these before, you're like, well, why didn't you just cut the corner and go right there? And it's because all this crude oil is pretty cold. And if we were to just drop the oil in here, then try to heat it into petroleum, it would be very inefficient. We'd be going from five degree crude oil to 400 degree crude oil, and it just, it wouldn't work as well. So what happens is all this fills with petroleum. And then the petroleum starts flowing down. And as the petroleum is flowing down, it's exchanging heat with these pipes. Now, in this case, we're using aluminum radiant liquid pipes. And some of the other petroleum boilers you've seen, they probably have five or six levels that snake around. And it's usually because they're using gold radiant liquid pipes. Because aluminum radiant liquid pipes have a higher thermal conductivity, we don't need as long to exchange the heat with the hot petroleum and the cold crude oil. What you're trying to get perfect is that way the hot crude oil comes out at around 395 degrees. That way, as soon as it hits this hot petroleum pool, it instantly flashes. That's how you know your petroleum boiler is working perfectly. You really don't see any oil sitting here. And if you do, it ain't for very long. This interchange right here is pretty important. So we're actually going to bring up two more temperature shift plates. But that's it. We don't want a temperature shift plate in contact with these radiant liquid pipes. Because these are going to be at 400 degrees and we don't want it to turn inside the pipes. And we all know what happens when that occurs. We have broken pipes. 
Now it's pretty common in petroleum boilers that you're gonna end up with one or two broken pipes. If that happens, do not worry. Start adding insulated pipes as you go down. We'll see if we need one of those. Then you'll notice I have a door here. The reason why I have a door here is because if things go horribly wrong and this petroleum gets too hot too quick and it flashes the sour gas, we don't want it to enter into this area. Now let's look at the rest of the pipes. I told you the petroleum will slowly make its way down here. This liquid pipe will take it and send it back to our colony. Now it's a lot of pipe spaghetti. It comes all the way over here, crosses through our oil biome, and then heads up. The first place it stops is here, where if we need petroleum for plastic, it'll make itself available. But the plastic production doesn't actually use that much petroleum. It'll eventually back up and continue going up, where it finally makes its way to our power brick. In our power brick, it splits off again into 10 petroleum generators. Okay, Echo, isn't that a bit excessive? Uh, not really. The reason why we have 10, we're actually going to be producing 10,000 grams of petroleum per second once it's fully upgraded. And 10,000 grams per second is actually enough petroleum for five generators. But remember, our generators aren't going to be working 100% of the time. We're also going to have our hydrogen generators. So once they get backed up and fill a total of 10 liquid storage tanks, the petroleum will continue on. Where else it'll finish in this giant tank? Why do we need a giant tank full of petroleum? Well, because it's petroleum. We're probably going to end up going to space on the backs of our beautiful petroleum production. So that's where the petroleum goes, but where does the oil come from? Well, this is more spaghetti. The furthest reaches of our oil production actually come from the slicksters and this one liquid pump. The liquid pump's going to grab it. It's going to send it down and down some more and down some more where it finally meets up with our three oil wells. And all the three oil wells, this one and this one, sends its oil this way. And then this one sends its oil this way and they converge right here at this point where they take a short little journey to the beginning of our petroleum generator. The start of our petroleum generator is actually right here at this liquid valve. We have it on zero grams a second. We don't want any crude oil right now. And you can see it's backed up and waiting for us to go. We actually start with just a very little bit of crude oil. You don't want to start it off full bore with 10,000 grams of oil because then you'll have a 10,000 gram problem instead of a very little problem. Once it makes its way in, when we unlock the liquid valve, it comes down here and then starts on its counter heat exchange all the way up here until it drops back into our tank. Now, before we set the temperature on this thermo sensor, we're actually going to fill this up with some oil. We want a lot of mass for this to be able to transfer into because it's going to transfer very, very quickly. And we need to make sure we catch it before it heats too much and flashes into petroleum. First, let's add some oil. Actually, first, let's lock this manual airlock. Beautiful. With the manual airlock locked so we know no duplicates get in here and run amok, let's go ahead and start with a thousand grams per second. Now, this liquid valve, it's not actually on an automated control. It's actually a duplicate that comes by and activates it manually. But because of that, it doesn't require any power. This whole thing operates on two pieces of power, one liquid pump, and then a door. We're about to run 10 petroleum generators on 360 watts. And most of the time, the door is not being powered. It only has to provide power when it's opening and closing. And just as we expected, it flashed too quickly. I forgot to set the thermo sensor to above. So as soon as liquid hit it that was cold and it was below 25 degrees, it opened this door and then flashed everything to sour gas. But that's the reason we take our little precautions. This metal tile is still cooling down, which is perfectly fine for our needs. We can still get in here, vacuum this out, and make sure we're good. So we filled this little area up with crude oil so I can highlight what I should have done the first time was after we filled it up, set it to 395. Now 395 is not our final temperature, but it at least get us warm enough to where we can start inching closer. And as you can see, even on normal speed, even at 395 degrees, it still goes up very, very quickly. You can see this petroleum is still sitting at 400 degrees. So we're going to have to play nice with it. We're going to barely inch it on and start very slowly and find out where that magic number is 
of where this thermosensor needs to be. It's not as easy as saying crude oil flashes the petroleum at 399 degrees, so just set this thermosensor on 399. There are too many variables in play. For instance, how quickly it's going to transfer this metal tile before it registers to this thermosensor and it knows, hey, I need to get with the program. By the time that happens, it could be running too hot. All right, the world's longest vacuum is finished up. We got just a couple pieces of debris and we're going to turn this on. We're going to start with just 100 grams per second. We already have a nice hot petroleum pool. And as it rises, that's where the efficiency of the system works so well. We have oil coming in here, but it's only at minus 34. So it's a little bit of a shock when it comes down on here under 410 degree petroleum. You can see the oil dripping down. Sometimes it doesn't even flash. It just instantly turns to petroleum. Our metal tiles are still sitting at 410 degrees. And that's what our thermo sensor set at 390. That's how quick that temperature exchange is. All right, I think we can see this is working just fine. Let's go ahead and kick this up a small notch. Let's go 500 grams a second. All right, we're at 500 grams a second, and it's not even impacting it. The metal tile is still only down to 409 degrees. All right, we set ourselves up with two kilos per second and at 395 degrees, and right now it's working great. The highest the petroleum gets is about 415 degrees, and it sits there for about a half to almost a full cycle before the door has to shut just for a fraction of a second. Paused it just in time so we can really see how it works. This metal tile is at 394, the petroleum's at 395, we have just a little bit of crude oil here. Instantly hits, flashes over to petroleum. The petroleum is at 415 degrees, and the metal tile the same. Well, let's get eager, shall we? Let's go with five kilos per second. Now, this is the most I'm going to be willing to go until we actually get the counterflow heat exchanger. All that does, though, really, is prep the crude oil, which means the heat in this pool will actually last longer before it needs to shut the door. I've watched the door open and close a couple of times before we start the counter heat exchange, and the petroleum only goes up around 10 degrees. Nothing for us to worry about here. The petroleum is finally hitting the level where it's coming up over the side, which is great. And what you can see what the effect is, right now the crude oil is at about 49 degrees. By the time it hits the end here, it's at 270. Now, it still has a lot more work to do once the petroleum gets all the way down here. But it also gives the benefit of actually reducing the temperature of the petroleum. So when we start pumping it, we're not pumping 200 degree petroleum. In fact, we're only using a steel liquid pump which means we can only hit 275 degrees before this liquid pump would actually break. All right, we're actually pumping petroleum out now, which means we're seeing the full range of heat from the crude oil coming in at 49 degrees and exiting into the tank right at about 390 to 395. And the petroleum, by the time it hits the liquid pump, is down to be about 49 degrees. All right, so this is exactly what we were talking about earlier. Because of where we were reaching to on the oil, we actually started flashing a little too soon, but this is not a big deal. All we do is take an obsidian insulated liquid pipe and we'll do two pipes just in case. And that should fix that problem. Now, when we're running full bore, we'll have to see if we need to insulate this third one too. Remember, this is just the thing that you have to do with petroleum boilers. You're always gonna have these little things you gotta fix because it is such a precise system. You can see here, the crude oil is coming in at around 390 degrees caps at around 392 from what I've seen. Now it's time to open it up full bore. Go up to 10 kilos per second, which is every bit of oil those wells can provide. Luckily, we even have some slicksters adding oil to the mix, so we're actually producing more than 10K per second. I've really let the system burn in. I've got the thermo sensor all the way up to 400 degrees. It's at this point, we hardly ever see any crude oil flash, save till the very end before the door is about to shut and by then it's okay we had to add one more insulated liquid pipe not too big of a deal it's been a couple of cycles let's go ahead and see how the petroleum's faring up to the top of our colony our first stop is at our plastic production because i turned plastic production off we're already backlogged here remember each polymer press can use a little over 800 grams per second of petroleum which is not even close to the 10,000 grams per second of petroleum that we are creating. The rest comes up here to this monstrosity where we have 10 petroleum generators. 
They are now providing just about 100% of our power, not counting when the hydrogen vent is running and the excess being provided by the hydrogen generator here. You can see we already have one liquid reservoir full and it's not gonna be long till this is full too and we start collecting it in our big old tank of petroleum. You can see here, we are still running at 10 kilos per second. We've been doing it for a few cycles now. No problems at all. The yo-yo is coming out at about 398 degrees, which is just about perfect. There's a couple of other things I wanted to mention because there are many different types of petroleum boilers is you'll sometimes see them that are only one tile high because that's really all you need to get the liquid pipe through. I choose not to do that because I like the repairability of being able to run in here because, well, I'm always going to break it on the first try, as you saw, all because I didn't flip this switch to make sure that door did not shut. As I was saying before, what a lot of times you'll see is a magma dropper around here. It'll drop magma down and then they'll use the magma here for the heat source. But it all comes down to this boilerplate right here. This is where the magic happens. So it doesn't matter how you get heat to it. If you're already into space metals and you have thermium, you can use a thermium aqua tuner and have the aqua tuner just dumping chill into a block of ice and it'll heat up past that 400 degree point where, well, that's all you need. Remember also that you need to double insulate the walls around your petroleum tank because of these temperature shift plates. You can get away with fewer temperature shift plates as well. I like to have them because I like to make sure the entire tank has great thermal conductivity. This bottom tile is 402 degrees and this top one is 402 degrees it really helps regulate it across the tank you can also see this insulated tile is 399 degrees that's because of these temperature shift plates and you definitely don't want 400 degrees being injected into your environment over here and you also don't want it to be messing with the simulation over here so i know a lot of you are watching this are saying whoa this might be out of my league i hope i've done a good enough job of explaining it so you don't feel that way but please feel free to post any questions in the comments below. There's a lot of people with a lot of experience on doing this a hundred different ways. Let's work together to pull off the system that you want to use. Otherwise, I hope you had a good time. I know I did. This is one of my favorite systems to create. And I'll talk to you soon.